Hello and welcome. My name is Raj Basord and I'm a consultant psychiatrist based in London. And I'm delighted to be joined today by Danny Wedding. Danny Wedding is a director of behavioral sciences at the American University of Antigua. And he's basically a professor of um, psychology and he's co-written with Ryan Nemec, a clinical psychologist, uh, an excellent book entitled Movies and Mental Illness and it's now in its fourth edition so it's been updated recently to take into account recent changes in the major classification systems of mental illness and it's published by Hograffa. So Danny let me start by asking you because this is a very unusual book that you seem to believe that um, clinicians, experts, patients and the general public can learn something about mental illness and psychological problems from watching films. That's a very odd idea, isn't it? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure, Raj. I, I think that uh, there's a great deal we can learn and I, I think that uh, it's been very useful for me to use films in the classroom and I teach psychiatrists and psychologists. I teach in a medical school and um, I oftentimes don't have the luxury of taking my students to psychiatric hospitals to show them what uh, a manic episode looks like or what uh, catatonia is or what uh, uh, a schizophrenic break looks like. But I can show them illustrations through films and through short clips from films. And so I think it's, it's pedagogically useful and I also think that the general public can learn a lot about mental illness by watching selected films. One of the really interesting things about your book is you've clearly done a lot of work to find the very best films um, that accurately portray or say something sensible or profound about extreme states of human experience. And you've very usefully catalogued um, the film. So, for example, if you were interested in in um, seeing a film that t said something about depression or schizophrenia or autism, you can find it very quickly by um, looking through the relevant chapter headings in the book. And the other really interesting thing about your book is you, you give quite a detailed analysis of each film you want to talk about and explain the strengths of the film in terms of its links with um, uh, mental illness. So are you saying that basically anyone, a clinician, expert, the lay public, a patient, could benefit from seeing the right kind of film if they're experiencing or want to learn about a particular disorder? Um, I think so. I think if you had a family member who was diagnosed with a uh, disorder like uh, bipolar disorder and you didn't know much about it, uh, you could go to the library, you could read about it, but another option is to just watch films that portray people who have that disorder and if you watch good films with accurate portrayals, you'll learn a lot about what to expect from your, from your loved one who has the disease. The other thing that I think is really interesting about your book is it introduces a new, almost a new kind of therapy, which I've been trying to, to do myself in my clinical practice. Often people struggle to understand something about themselves or the disorder, and recommending a particular film that they go and watch and then we discuss in another therapeutic consultation is often a, a, an excellent way of, of, um, of doing psychotherapy with people. And the other really interesting thing is that people often find it quite difficult to talk about themselves, but often it's easier to talk about yourself by talking about a phenomenon in a film. Is that, was that one of the intentions of the book? It was like a, a new kind of psychotherapy? Well, I, I think that's that's very perceptive for you to recognize that. I, I used to practice in uh, West Virginia, which was a very poor state, and I would occasionally have, have patients who were illiterate. And so while with most of my patients, I'd recommend bibliotherapy and give them a list of, of books to read that uh, I thought would be relevant to their treatment, uh, if someone has a third or fourth grade education, they're probably not going to go out and buy a book and take it home and read it but they would go watch a movie and, and uh, sometimes I could uh, recommend a film that would uh, trigger discussion in the next therapy session. So I think that, that films can be used in psychotherapy in much the way that books are used for bibliotherapy. You've also written another book which features more on positive um, human traits um, and the portrayal of that. Um, can films inspire people? Can they help people through difficult mental states? Can they be actually therapeutic 
uh, in the way that a psychological therapy could be therapeutic or an antidepressant could be therapeutic? Um, I think they can. I think that all of us have seen films that, that inspire us, that encourage us, that give us hope. Um, I uh, found that the, the first book was fairly successful, so our publisher came to us and asked us if we'd be willing to write a second book about those films that, that portrayed the best in human beings, not the worst. Uh, and so we moved to the other end of the spectrum and tried to find films that illustrated uh, virtues and character strengths. And the, the second book ties into the movement called Positive Psychology. And uh, instead of looking at, at uh, the worst in people, instead of looking at, at illness and disease and pathology, we tried to pick out films that illustrate the best in people. Uh, films that illustrate uh, courage and justice and temperance and uh, kindness, love, vitality, persistence, bravery, that sort of thing. Okay, well, well let's, let's come back to that in a minute, but let's pick the subject of depression, because depression is probably one of the commonest psychological problems that people are going to confront. And let's pick a couple of films that you mentioned in your chapter on depression. Let's pick perhaps a really mainstream film that many people will at least have heard of, if not seen, which is a film called The Beaver, with Mel Gibson. Could you say a little bit about this film and why you think this film is about depression? Well, uh, Mel Gibson's character is, is, is clearly depressed. Uh, he's, he's diagnosed with depression. He has depressed affect. He has trouble sleeping. He has classic signs of depression. And he, uh, 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 in effect, treats himself. He, he goes off and uh, gets a, uh, a handheld puppet in the shape of a beaver and he starts talking to himself and and when he's thinking uh, things that uh, don't make a lot of sense that uh, uh, are probably not conducive to his uh, his mental state he has the, the beaver respond and uh, in effect the beaver becomes a, a surrogate therapist that accompanies him throughout the film and I won't spoil the film for people who haven't seen it, but at the end, he uh, severs his relationship with the beaver. Um, it was, uh, uh, I thought it was a remarkable film, although it's not well known, but it uh, got a, uh, a, a SAMHSA Voice Award. SAMHSA is in the United States, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and they try to recognize films that... Uh, are particularly good at portraying mental illness and the problems of confronted by people who have a mental illness. And in 2011, The Beaver was selected as uh, as the, the best film of that year uh, for portraying mental illness. And also, uh, Jodie Foster stars, uh, directed it and stars in it, and, and she's a favorite actress. Um, and I think Mel Gibson does an excellent job playing the lead character, Walter Black. Now, I, I thought it was an interesting choice as well because I think that many of the films that you pick are often saying something a bit more profound about mental illness than, um, and you've got to read between the lines. So, for example, one of the take-home messages for me, and obviously people may take home different messages, is that one of the mistakes is to think that the treatment of any psychological problem or depression is a standard treatment, that, that everyone gets better if you take this antidepressant or if you do cognitive behavioral therapy, this is the correct approach. That There's a sense in which people have to muddle through a bit and find what's right for them. And, and Mel Gibson kind of does that in this film. And the other thing is that sometimes um, what gets people better is something quite quite dramatic that changes the way they relate to the world or the way they relate to other people. And the puppet in this case is an example of that. Um, so I don't know what, if you want to say anything about that. Idea. Well, as, as a, a practicing psychiatrist, you're aware of the fact that people respond uh, in very idiosyncratic ways to, to both medication and psychological treatments. And so there's, there's not one size that fits every patient and I, I don't think you can do cookbook therapy and, and, and treat every depressed patient in exactly the same way. And so with The Beaver, we see a very creative approach, and we see a film that, that uh, teaches us something about, um, about mental illness. For example, we know that uh, there's a genetic component to depression, and uh, we find that, that um, 
uh, Mel Gibson's son in the film is uh, dealing with depression in his own way, and so you can see the heritability there of the illness. Okay, let's pick another film, um, The Hours, which some people might say is a more profound film or a more serious film. Some people might say that. Could you say a little bit about The Hours and why you picked that film? Uh, I thought it was an incredible film, and um, it, it illustrates the life of Virginia Woolf, and I think it's well documented that Virginia Woolf had bipolar disorder. I think there's a little question about it, and the film uh, presents... Uh, her life in, in a very accurate way, and uh, I think it's a uh, remarkable uh, uh, presentation of what bipolar disorder looks like. So I thought it was a great movie artistically, but I also thought it was a, uh, just an excellent portrayal of uh, bipolar disorder. But a somewhat pessimistic film, though. I'm, I'm surprised or interested that... Uh that you went with it, given given that point. But, I mean, maybe you don't agree it's a pessimistic film. Well, um, it, it, uh, the, the Virginia Woolf story is actually very sad. As you know, she committed suicide by putting rocks in her pocket and wading out into a stream, and the film shows her committing suicide, and uh, uh, there are excerpts from her suicide note that she wrote. Uh, but I, uh, we, we use the, the book to uh, primarily for pedagogical purposes, and so we want students to get a sense for what uh, depressed people think and what they look like and how they present and how they act. And so for students, I think it's, it's uh, a very accurate portrayal of what a patient would look like who is grappling with uh, the kind of depression that accompanies bipolar disorder. Okay, so let's go to, in the beginning of the, of the book, um, you describe what you call the top ten psychopathology films. I just run through the list very quickly. Uh, Black Swan, A Beautiful Mind, Apocalypse Now, Silver Linings Playbook, Inception, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Psycho, The Lost Weekend, Vertigo, and A Clockwork Orange. Let's talk a bit about Psycho, because a very famous film when it came out, um, yet today, many young people, particularly students that you would be teaching and that, that I teach, have never heard of it. Why, why do you regard that as an important film? Well, I, I think it has uh, some importance in part because it's, it's one of the, uh, the major films in, in the history of uh, filmmaking. Uh, and, of course, it was made by Alfred Hitchcock, one of the, the, the all-time leading directors. And Hitchcock was very psychologically minded. He has this wonderful quote where he says that, that uh, movies are simply life with the dull parts left out. And um, I thought it was a remarkable movie. It, it, it's a little bit simplistic, and as you know, it, it uh, suggests a Freudian explanation for aberrant behavior. But it is still a very gripping film, and one of the joys of, of teaching uh, psychiatrists and psychologists as I get to introduce a new generation of students to films like uh, One Floor of the Cuckoo's Nest or Psycho or Clockwork Orange that are classic movies that most of my students haven't seen. So inevitably when they watch Psycho they come in with questions and we talk about dissociative identity disorder and what that means and whether or not a person would present like Norman Bates and whether or not somebody could assume the identity of their mother. So uh, we, we deal with those issues in the classroom, and, and my students love talking about psycho. So um, Gabbard and Gabbard, who wrote another famous book about psychiatry in the cinema, mentioned psycho and films around that time as representing a key turning point in the way psychiatry and psychiatrists are portrayed. In the film Psycho, there's a denouement scene at the end, and I don't want to spoil the film for people who haven't seen it. Basically, um, it's a turning point because normally up until this moment, when a heinous crime has been committed, a detective comes in at the final scene and explains everything. But in this film, it's a psychiatrist who comes in in the final scene and kind of explains everything, and it's clearly very cleverly portrayed by Hitchcock with clever bits of direction as the authority figure uh, that everyone should pay attention to. And in fact... The nice bits of direction indicate that the police defer to the psychiatrist as having a superior understanding of, of the criminal mind in this particular example. But basically, psycho represents the, the pinnacle of a kind of psychoanalytic 
understanding of, of human disorder, and it's kind of downhill from there on in, coinciding with the rise of biological psychiatry. So increasingly you see psychiatrists negatively portrayed in films, perhaps culminating with Hannibal Lecter in Silence of the Lambs, and, and, maybe, and oddly enough this coincides with the rise of biological psychiatry. But tr the trouble is that if your explanation of human behavior boils down to a 5-HT2A receptor in the human brain, that doesn't lend itself to filmmaking. And psychoanalysis does lend itself to filmmaking, the kind of story that psychoanalysts tell. Um, do, do you think there, that, that there's something, uh, that, that there's a kind of divergence between filmmaking and scientific understanding of mind and brain, and that's one of the reasons why maybe academics um, don't use films in the way that you're, you're trying to, that they despair of the way films portray um, mental illness, because that's kind of story approach that psychoanalysis um, uh, embraced um, isn't fashionable anymore in psychology and psychiatry. Right, you still see uh, uh, films uh, in, in which the, uh, the uh, psychiatrist or psychologist is portrayed in a, uh, a very positive way uh, like Goodwill Hunting, but uh, but I, I agree very much with Glenn Gabbard, somebody I respect and admire very much, and he's probably the uh, the, the the most respected person working in this area. And uh, the, the uh, Psycho and the uh, the early '60s uh, did represent a pinnacle in the esteem in which psychiatry and psychology was held. And a decade later, in a film like The Exorcist, you see. Uh, psychiatrist looking pretty inept, and in a film like What About Bob, you have a psychologist who uh, who just looks a, a bit goofy. Uh, and then, of course, in Silence of the Lambs, you have a, a psychiatrist who turns out to be uh, positively evil. So there has been this deterioration of, of the image of mental health professionals in films uh, over the past uh, uh, 50 years, I believe. So um, let's talk about mistakes that films make in the way they portray mental illness or the treatment of mental illness. They're, they're classic recurring cliches about, for example, the causation of mental illness in films. Over and over again you see this idea that it's a traumatic event, particularly in your childhood, that causes mental illness. That the correct treatment of mental illness is the love of a good woman, basically, as for example in um, A Beautiful Mind. Not the drugs, or the psychotherapy, but the love of a good woman is what will pull you around. Um, and um, uh, there, there, there are errors like this, that catharsis, that, that um, expressing some deep repressed memory will be what will cure your, your mental illness. What are your thoughts about these errors that films make over and over again? Um, I, I do think there are recurring themes, and, and um, there, there are five that I generally talk about when I give lectures on this topic. Um, the most common theme that is, is a, a mistake, I think, is, is that people with mental illness are uh, oftentimes uh, likely to be violent and uh, be homicidal. And we know pretty well that somebody with a disease like schizophrenia is far more likely to be the victim of violence than a perpetrator of violence. But in a, a movie like The Shine, you see Jack Nicholson becoming mentally ill and trying to kill his wife and child, and um, that's probably the most, most recurring uh, erroneous theme that you find in, in film history. Um, you alluded to the, uh, the, the belief in, in traumatic ideology, and you find this in uh, movies uh, like The Three Faces of Eve, um, uh, movies that suggest that something in childhood, usually a uh, repressed memory, was the cause of a person's mental illness. If uh, you see the Robin Williams film, uh, The Fisher King, you, you see that he uh, experienced a traumatic uh, uh, incident in his life. His fiance was gunned down in a restaurant, and uh, the film suggests that he developed the symptoms of schizophrenia uh, as a basis of this uh, traumatic experience, but of course, uh, trauma produces the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, not the kind of symptoms you find with schizophrenia. Uh, another common mistake that you find in films, and it's especially troubling for me, is the, uh, the uh, belief 
the, the, the intimation that uh, parents cause their children to become schizophrenic. Uh, you find this with the, uh, the idea of the schizophrenogenic mother who, because of bad mothering practices, uh, causes her child to develop autism or schizophrenia. Uh, if you saw the movie Shine about David Hefklot, the pianist, uh, the film suggests that his, his overbearing father was the cause of his mental illness. Um, another, another theme that you see in films often is that uh, people with mental illness aren't really sick. They don't have an illness. They're just eccentric. Um, you find this, I, I think, best illustrated in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, uh, a classic film that my students inevitably love when I introduced them to it. And uh, the character of Randall P. McMurphy is, uh, he winds up in a psychiatric hospital because of statutory rape, and he thinks that uh, being in a psych hospital is better than being in a chain gang, and so he feigns the symptoms of mental illness, but the, the viewer all along knows that uh, Jack Nicholson is not mentally ill. He is just um, uh, an antisocial personality, perhaps. And then there's that, that theme that, that uh, love alone is sufficient to heal mental illness. And, and the unfortunate thing is that there's a corollary to that. And the corollary is that if, if somebody doesn't get better, it must be because they weren't loved enough, that their parents failed them or their spouse failed them or their family failed them. And uh, we know that, that love is important. Having a supportive, caring, nurturing family is vital to uh, recovery from a mental illness, but it's, it's not sufficient. So I think those are the most common themes that occur again and again in, uh, in movies. Okay, so I'm going to put you on the spot here, and, and, and feel free to run screaming from the room at this, but if someone is listening to this and is a bit low, feeling a bit depressed, could you recommend a film or two that you think would cheer them up or inspire them or would help them with their struggle with depression or low mood? Uh, gee, there, there are uh, hundreds of films that we, uh, we talk about in, uh, in both books, uh, and they're cataloged in the appendix, but a, a recent film uh, that I found uh, very, very positive and uplifting and encouraging was Silver Linings Playbook, and it deals with two individuals, both of whom have psychological problems, but who get together and develop a loving relationship and, and it shows them coping very effectively with their problems and supporting one another. So I, I recommend it highly. That's a very interesting choice because I would have gone with that choice as well. And what I like about that film is there's a couple of important messages there, which is that um, engagement w with the outside world is a core part of the treatment. Anyway, our, our phone line is deteriorating a little bit, so we may have to wrap this up uh, quickly. Um, but what's your favorite film in terms of things that a film that you like to look at that might inspire you or cheer you up? Uh, one of my, my favorite films dealing with mental illness is, is Ron Howard's A Beautiful Mind. And it's about the life of John Nash, the Nobel laureate. It's a wonderful film. Ron Howard takes some liberties with it. He uh, portrays John Nash as having visual hallucinations. And as you know, with a disease like schizophrenia, auditory hallucinations are far more common, far more frequent than, than visual hallucinations. But I think the, the movie is quite inspiring and uh, one of my all-time favorites. Great. Well, thank you very much, Danny, for that. Uh, the book is entitled Movies and Mental Illness. It's, part, it's written by Danny Wedding and um, Ryan Nynick. And it's published by Hografa. And uh, it's an excellent book. And I thoroughly recommend it. Danny Wendy, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Raj. I've enjoyed talking to you.